Welcome to episode 10 of Staying Alive with me, Jesse Smith, a podcast about creative people and how we do those things we do. So having mentioned it last week on the pod, the government did announce a 1.57 billion package to help the cultural heritage and arts institutions. Fair play, I guess. But the question is now, how will these funds be allocated and used? Will theatres and venues use the money to stay closed? Or will they be using the money to be innovative and create COVID friendly changes so that musicians and performers can get back on the stage? At present, public performances still aren't allowed, so it seems like it will still be a while before we're back rocking and rolling. Speaking of rock and roll, today's guest is rock and roll through and through. I've had the privilege of sharing a stage with her on many occasions, and she's one of the most inspirational women I've ever met. She plays guitar for the likes of Kate Nash and Get Kate Where Kate Fly, as well as being a brilliant artist in her own right. Today's guest is the absolute badass that is Linda Barato. I was wondering what you were going to be wearing because we're in lockdown. Most people are just wearing like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> most people are just wearing like tracksuit bottoms or whatever but you as per usual wearing the most amazing thing so just to describe it to our listeners because this is going to be just audio. all right all right uh, sweet. but you can do the you can do the dance for me i'm enjoying it uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just, it's this just... incredible like bright yellow jacket <laughs> with like red and blue patterns on it so what like i've never met anyone who dresses like you and i love it so much like what why do you wear all these amazing colors and stuff is it just an extension of your personality or? i think so i mean i don't know like i feel like um it's it's got worse <laughs> with the years <laughs> it's like, but i think in a way it's like i don't know it's like i i the perfect example is like i went back for christmas at home and i we did this dinner i was like nobody's allowed to wear black and right. literally everybody showed up in black and i was like oh my god you know so for me it's just a bit like it just makes me happy i guess so just like it, it's a bit of a joke and it's like i know that sometimes it makes some people happy as well so i guess i see it that way maybe yeah well, it it lights up my life every time I see you. <laughs> Actually, your your birthday party a few was it your thirtieth? Yeah. And everyone was dressed like you, weren't they? It was like kind of <laughs> yeah. like it's like what was the theme again? Like it was nineties uh, opera skis and the nineties pool party. Yeah. <laughs> Which is I mean, basically that, it, like that my is basically you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was just like the best. Everyone just looked incredible. It was like walking into the inside of your brain. That's what I thought it was. Mate. Like. You had incredible hair, like, which I think you should rock all the time. You had, yeah, like, did, didn't I have, like, Britney Spears sort of plaits type yeah, thing? Yeah, it was so good, man. It was like you just came out of a, a mixture between Prodigy and Linkin Park. Like, yeah. You were just like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to rock that anytime soon. But good. <laughs> so you, you mentioned home there. Obviously, um, are you from, is it Bologna that you grew up? Yeah. Bologna. Yeah, Bologna. What? Um, because I I just imagine the way I imagine Italy to be. Obviously, I've been quite a few times. I just I can't really picture you walk around. <laughs> like, were you? Did you always feel like the odd one out in a way? Um, I think so. I think like I did it. I kind of made myself fit in in a way. Uh, but the more I look, the more I spend time away, the more I'm like oh, this is why I had to go away because, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. this place was kind of... But, you know, like, I think I always had my ways, but um, there is... I think I've taken, you know, there's something about, like, Italians that, like, I remember, like, some people would, like, dress up to bring the trash out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. you can't go out in your track suits. So I think it, that's, like, kind of... But I do it in my own way, whereas I wear, like, insane track suits and bring my trash out, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Like, and how about your how about your family what what did your parents do and stuff um so 
my um, both my parents worked in fashion. Mm. My great, we can go back very like a few generations. Yeah. So my great, Do it. my great grandfather was a shoemaker, so he had like a little shop. And then um, my grandma, she started drawing shoes uh, for him. And then when she married her grandfather, they started this uh, leather good and shoe company. Amazing. Which um, then became international and all over the world. And so all my mom, my mom has like five, there's like five of them siblings and they all worked in this company. Uh, and then my dad used to work in another fashion thing, but then he, he started working there. So basically we, we just grew up in leather goods. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I used to like go like, the, you know, there would be like, the there's a season where all the shop directors from all over the world come over so we would go they bring me to the showroom and i would just like be seven years old like playing around all these shoes and like in this crazy thing with all like suited up people it was like quite crazy like backstory you know <laughs> like, yeah yeah absolutely. Um, and um and yeah my dad like he he took care of the like north american um, he works in a, in America a lot, so like I used to travel there a lot with him. Um, so yeah, it's like it's it's interesting because I the more I go on about like the more time passes, like I really appreciate like the war. Like my my granddad is ninety and he retired last year. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> and it, but he's just like a fucking you know. 1950 entrepreneur you know he did it like he, yeah. he just did his thing and he's still like a very fresh guy like he he talks about like you know online shopping and shit like that and he's like 19 years like 90 years old like <laughs> it's crazy do you think that instilled uh work ethic in you before we started recording you told me you haven't been doing that much the last <laughs> few days in lockdown yeah <laughs> i think like that's the problem with a lot of my family like even my mom is like we're all like ah gotta do gotta do stuff gotta do stuff gotta do stuff you know yeah. it's like um yeah. so there's definitely a workaholic uh syndrome in where we are so yeah that's yeah, good yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and growing up where you did do you when you move out of somewhere like that does the food everywhere just taste rubbish um Yes. <laughs> I mean, it depends where you go, like, but I think, like, uh, it, it's funny because when, uh, when uh, I moved here to England, I did a university in Guildford, right? I went to music school and I lived in this house and we used to be called Casa Azzurri, you know, like the Italian football uh, national team because yeah. people would just come over and we would just make pasta for everybody. Yeah. And it was... And nobody could believe that we were just cooking for everybody because for us, it was just normal that if you're in my house, I'm not going to like eat in front of you. I'm just going to cook for you, you know? So yeah, it's like, yeah. um, but I think, I don't know. I don't, I think England is pretty, I mean, London is amazing for food. So, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, That's the thing. I always say to people that London's kind of, it's got the best cuisine in the world because we've got everything here. Yeah. You can have you can have like sushi at like two in the morning that's really good somewhere, or you can have like Vietnamese food, or you can have French food or whatever. And exactly, there's, yeah. there's actually a little Sicilian place just opposite my house that I love, and I go there all the time. And in lockdown, they're doing like like freshly made um, like handmade pasta and oh my God. like sourdough. So we're just buying it from there, and it's like amazing. Mate. Yeah, I'm gonna do that tonight. We're like, we're uh, we are like, this is my master chef, and in the, there's like four of us in the house, and everybody loves cooking. So we're like yeah. every night. So where are you now? Um, I live in Highbury in Islington. Cool. And uh, I live with a uh, uh, my mate Jay, who's a producer, um, uh, and then his brother and his uh, girlfriend, which they're working, um. So, you know, it's nice. Like, we eat together. It's like, I haven't had this vibe since, like, I lived at home where we're just like, you know, we have dinner together. We have lunch together. Yeah. And it's like, it's very sweet, actually. Like, um, I'm I'm really grateful for the situation I'm in. You know, I'm not in a, like, nightmare of a household or, like, terrible housemates. Like, everybody gets on and it's fun, you know, so. Yeah, I really feel for people who aren't happy with their living situation and are stuck in lockdown. It must be awful. 
Yeah, it's yeah. So, especially like if you don't have uh, either a garden or you know, like imagine like it's just a nightmare. So yeah, let's go back to um to when you moved and you said you came over. So you went to ACM, right? So how old yeah. were you when you was that the reason that you moved over to study? Yeah, there? I actually um I lived in Barcelona before uh, moving here for a year. Um, and I was doing a school a music school there because uh it was a school that basically. Uh, I only had to do two years and then I could have gone to Berkeley in America because that was my dream as like 18 years old. And then I went into the school and realized how much jazz and music stuff that was happening. I was like, this is definitely not for me. And I was like, where is the music I love the most from? And then I thought of Jimmy Page and like all the classics. I was like, Ilford. Like, sorry, mate. Yeah. So, yeah, so then I just, like, uh, left Barcelona, went back to Italy for a little bit, and then I came to ACM. And so when did, like, growing up, were you always playing guitar? Like, when did you get your first guitar? And um, Yeah, I, I started, my dad played when I was little. And I started when I was seven years old, uh, out of just, like, I just wanted to, I just always wanted to play and my dad loves music so I always had like really good music around like my first concert was Tina Turner when I was six years old but like, that was that's fucking amazing that's so cool and um um and I had um yeah so then yeah and I just played classical for a while and then when I was 12 or 13 I just had my first electric guitar and I was like whoa <laughs> that yeah. is sick and then I was just doing that like and you know like especially in Italy like growing up like there's no music in education at all like um so it was always kind of and if if there's any it's mainly classical so it was kind of hard to like do it in a way but I knew I just wanted to do it so I just you know I just kept going for it and luckily my parents really supported me through it and they were like yeah just do it so you know and was there any was there any like gigs going in Italy that where you can actually sort of make any money as a musician? Because I, yeah. I I swear I know so many, like, I swear I know more Italian musicians in London than I know English ones. Yeah. They say, oh, we just moved over because there's you know there's not as many gigs and whatever. But. It's just like it's all covers, you know. Like you just do covers and you play and you get paid well like to play in a bar like you get you for covers like you you can when I was 17 I was probably making more than like sometimes when you go down the pub here yeah you know what I mean? like but because there's a different you know it's a different way of doing stuff there but um my I was in this uh, Led Zeppelin tribute band we were all girls and it was called Lady Zeppelin amazing <laughs> and um there was there was literally like I think three or four female guitarists in the whole of Italy and we all knew each other one is Carmen that you know like our mate uh, and a few others so we all like kind of at some point played in this band you know what I mean Mm. like and uh um and it was it was super fun then and we would just like travel around Italy and just play like all the um like treatment band is a huge thing in Italy you know what I mean it's like yeah yeah (laughs) Like, I actually went out and did a festival near, it was like in a castle on the coast, about an hour from Rome. (laughs) And we we did our Led Zeppelin thing. It was this bizarre, like, it was, it was like a war thing. So there was like Ukraine and Russia and America, and they all had like full on armor on, like, literally like, and they, and real swords and real like shields. And they literally would just like beat the, beat the shit out of each other what basically. the fuck I and hope you like... play cashmere while they were doing <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> exactly <laughs> ah just like full on like and yeah it was basically <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> was like... <laughs> yeah and it, it's literally like last man standing type thing and then like it's kind of like an honor thing like when you were down like uh you were down and you didn't get back up and then it was like really dangerous man i think like people have died there and stuff anyway i digress so yeah we we played the like closing ceremony with our uh led zeppelin band so yeah wow. <laughs> mate that, i've never seen anything like that in italy i would love to see that <laughs> yeah i think it must be a thing that goes like to different countries every year kind of thing yeah i but, mean it's a good setup though we have a lot of fortress vibe there. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> you have a lot of history for sure yeah so then Going back to go back to ACM, 
did how do you look back on your training and stuff because i know i know some people some people love their training and some people kind of they loved sort of the connections they made and stuff but the actual kind of college itself they didn't like so much so what was your vibe i think like because um i was just nerding out when i was in my teens so by the time i got to acm like a lot of the stuff that we did was a bit repetition for me so like i wouldn't but but definitely for me it was like i never look back and be like oh that was crap like but i loved the people that i met there so Mm. much you know like the community that uh, most of the people that you know it's our our mates that we play with you know still we hang out are from that era you know so um um i think that was really important and um, because it was in Guildford and not in London, I think we definitely had more of a community because it was a small town. So we had a bit of a university campus vibe, you know, and then we had like Surrey Uni there. So um, I definitely, I loved it, you know. And also, I guess my connection to my after university thing which is like, you know, I started playing with Kane Nash because I went to ACM because her manager came and looked for a band there. So, um, you know, I kind of, I don't look back at me like that was terrible. Like, I, I love it. I think there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of problems in with music schools that they're a business. And sometimes they're like, they train you to be an office musician what i say you know they leave creativity a little bit behind and i think maybe that's changing a little bit now and they're trying to infuse a little bit more of that but um yeah i think they kind of they use you as kind of a success story as well don't they i've seen a few videos of like linda (laughs) barata alumni (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) no it's, it's cool you know they obviously it's good that they still support you even now like when, like years yeah i mean i haven't had any sort of communication with them whatsoever since but i think it's like yeah it's, it's good and i'm not embarrassed you know i'm not embarrassed it was like a platform for me to, to move to england and and also meet a network you know like because it just meant that i didn't have to it, it was a different way of coming here like i would just come here and just like uh, i met straight in musicians that were studying you know rather than try and go to every single london jam like you know it's a, it was a different experience for sure yeah yeah and obviously we met at, at rock the boat Woo! <laughs> and, <laughs> shout, but, out, shout out shout out shout out <laughs> how would you describe rock the boat especially in those early days to to people who don't know what it is and don't know what we're talking about um so I got a call from uh, Luigi, who's our mate, who's a bassist, and he was like, oh, like, I'm doing this, uh, they want us to start this uh, night, and some of us were, we were just, like, going out a lot at the time, and, like, playing, ending up playing a lot of, like, I don't know, ending up, like, with acoustic guitar playing a lot of rock covers, so it was like, what, why don't we just do this in a bar, <laughs> like, yeah. and so Luigi um, called me up, was like, oh, I think I found a night, and then... He called this other guy, Marco, and then it was like, oh, we got a singer. And, my, and he was like, oh, he's amazing, Jesse, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, cool. And I remember I got there and you were wearing this hat, <laughs> you know. I was like, was I? Yeah, he had a hat on. And I was oh, like, I never wear hats. That must have been like the only time. <laughs> I was like, cool. Like, I was like, this guy is serious. <laughs> uh, and then we never met right and we just put together like a set list of like 25 songs or something yeah and then and then we just went on stage and i think that at the beginning of the night there was literally five people there and then we started playing and it was like whoa this is fun (laughs) and we started like playing every single rock cover that we loved and we ended it you know, I remember that in the early days, every time we ended a song, it was like Wembley. It was like, <laughs> except yeah, for like yeah. five people there. <laughs> but at the end of that first night, I remember clearly that we played, I think, um, some Nirvana or something. And then there was mosh pit in or something. I was yeah. like, what is going on? This is hilarious. And Ashby, who's 
you know your your Keith Richards, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like he he showed up, and I just remember, I was like, who's this guy? And he just came on stage, and he was just like playing. It was amazing. I was like, wow. And then from there, I guess every Sunday we used to do this from what 9 p.m. until 2 a.m. just playing. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, it was amazing. I always I always think that for me because I obviously I did the thriller thing, and then then I kind of got settled in London. And obviously I never went to I never went to music school or uni or anything. And I always feel like Rock the Boat was like me finding my people, you know. Yeah. Obviously you you already had that little community, but I'd been in, in the quotes with Ashby, like you say, and like my friend Liam and Dan for years and then then gone off and done like the thriller thing and then come back to town and sort of I didn't really know that many people in London really. And it was just like this perfect this perfect little scene of people that were just like-minded and loved the same music and yeah because we, we just played like stuff we loved didn't we we never played sweet child of mine it was always just yeah. like oh if we played it is because we were like fuck it let's do it yeah <laughs> like, yeah you know, exactly like, it was never like oh we have to like you yeah, know yeah exactly yeah. yeah and it was so much fun and um yeah it's, it was always just like a I, I read about like the Nambuka times where it was all like Frank Turner and the Holloways and and like Beans on Toast and all those people and that and Sam obviously that you you play yeah. now and um, I really feel like the kind of Silver Bullet Rock the Boat thing was that for for us for us you know? yeah 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 definitely I think it was it was a magic a magical time like I'm I'm surprised we all survived it as well <laughs> like mm. in a way like yeah but it was like um yeah I look back and it was like but because it was similar for me like I had just come back from uh from like a couple of years of touring and not being in London a lot like I moved from Guildford whilst I was touring so I didn't have a lot of people in London I had this little community but we were just like we I just wanted to play you know and I and I was missing that, you know, because one thing is going on tour, but the other is like if you're a musician that just loves like going up and just have a little jam, you know, like that's that's what it was, you know. But also there was like, you know, we would end up on the floor, like you know, it was amazing, yeah. like you know, there was like a vibe. It's just like bought this ball of hair and guitars and sweat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just like what the hell is going on? I think yeah. what what I loved about it as well was that everyone was. It was a real inclusive like bunch of people. I thought like it didn't matter like what color you were or where you were from, like or where, obviously there was tons of women involved with it, which was amazing for me. I think. I think Rock the Boat was the first time actually I'd ever been on stage with like me plus four women on stage, you know. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, like I think one time it was like me, Vicky, uh, maybe Aisha was there that night as well, and Emma, and just like yeah. it's just it was just the it always seemed like a really inclusive bunch of people, and that's why yeah. I loved it as well. Yeah, and I remember like because you know that's interesting because I remember when uh, having a conversation about. Uh, women in music for instance with um i think it was um it was probably mark at the time and it was any because of rock the boat i remember him telling us like yeah but i know plenty of female musicians I was like yeah you know them all because they're all come here <laughs> but yeah, that's literally yeah. all there is there's like six of us <laughs> so like you know like and luckily that's that's changing but i think that was definitely part of it that made it fun and also like you know i guess part of it do you remember like we we started going to muse that was like a lesbian bar in soho and like mm. we started playing there and i think it was like you know we definitely brought together a lot of groups that normally wouldn't be together you know like i i love that about what yeah. we're doing yeah definitely i hope yeah. so anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> And what, what I always love about you, Linda, more than honestly, more than anyone I've ever met, is just you're just this bundle of energy, like off, off stage, but on stage in particular. Like as soon as you get on the stage, there's just like a different vibe in the room. I, it's just that to, I, like that. It's just this kind of undefinable thing. I remember we were doing a Rock the Boat night in Nambuka about it must have been about a year ago or a year and a half ago. And it was kind of like an okay night. It was there's probably thirty people there or something, and it was like it was fine. But it's just all us guys on stage, and it was all just like I don't know. It's just 
it was just kind of like an okay night. And I just remember you walking in or probably running in and just be like, <laughs> hey, and like, you just like jumped up on the stage and like suddenly the whole night just changed. It's like, oh man, thanks. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, you know, you've, you've got it. So <laughs> I think, I think there is definitely, I, because of what you were saying actually about Italy of the way it is, like I think guitar and playing music for me is unleashing a lot of it. I keep a lot of energy in, you know, and then like, so when I get on stage, I'm like, I literally, I can't, I, I don't care anymore. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's kind of, that's, that's where the energy goes. And I think, you know, sometimes it translates into God knows what's going to happen and it's a train wreck, but I go with it because it's part of the energy, you know, so I guess it's, a, it's more of a raw thing. I was just going to go back and ask about, about Kate. So I didn't actually realise that it was like, a, it was through ACM that you, you kind of got, end up getting that gig. So was what was the audition process like and and when did you first meet Kate oh, mate, it was hilarious so we we got we had like there was this um group like the business department of the of ACM and the they just connected students with industry you know like um the Beckin singer of Crystal Fighters Ellie was in my year as well like you know a lot of people got like nice gigs out of it yeah I think and uh um, so I think the manager that Kate uh, had at the time uh, went to ACM so and Kate wanted to start playing with an all-female band. So we um, we basically just like went to the Katematon, the Ka- Katematon in Broadway Market, you know, that pub. I don't actually. Uh, it's like, I, yeah, so we migrated from Gil for all of like, the, like, <laughs> the, the, the like seven female like instrumentalists yeah. in the whole of the school <laughs> like you migrated to like Broadway market and then um and then we just had a chat with Kate um and then we had to learn a couple of songs but as it ran I think she was she went on tour to Australia and, and Brazil and then so we just got a call back and um and actually my friend got the gig first Carmen and then uh when uh, after a year uh she uh moved on to another band so then when that happened i took over um i basically took over that gig and that was at the beginning of um kate's third album cycle which uh, is girl talk which is basically the album where she went a bit uh she went a bit punk and riot and it was a journey to remember yeah <laughs> um and it was yeah it was it's definitely like I, w- I look back and it is, it, it's changed completely the course of like what mu- kind of musician and what I've done with my life. I think playing for Kate. Uh, well, one thing is also like I'm like 23 just out of university and I tour in the world like, you know, and doing gigs from like 200 people to like 500 people festival of like 10,000 people. 80,000 yeah. people it's like crazy you know so you're just like whoa and and it's completely different from what they tell you at school you know so you have to like find your way but also I'm working for an artist like hey like she got dropped uh on that album and looking back and the reason why she got dropped it was just because she was they wanted her to be like this pop artist but she was not the vintage clothes like pop artists she wanted to do her own thing like you know there's much more to it than just like the marketing behind it so I did this very unique experience of touring to a major label level but independently so it was like very um I don't know interesting like and you know up to you know the, it was some part of it was very DIY and like how the hell they would pull that off and so part of it's were like cool like this is awesome like she of course had a an amazing fan base from her previous two albums so yeah 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 and what's your relationship like with Kate and how's it changed over the years um well we're like you know I think she, she's she's like a sister to me now like she's we're really good friends um you know, and, you know, she she has two sisters, like, she really cares about family, and I'm really, I really care about community, family, like, you know, wolf pack, so I think mm-hmm. we always got on 
uh, for that. And I still, I'm still playing for her. And I think the more, you know, last year I went out to LA and wrote uh, an album with her and, you know, it's, it's more collaborative. Like I don't, I don't see Kate as my boss or just like I play, you know, it's like more, I, she's an artist I collaborate with, you know, like, so, um, and it's amazing. Like, um, that's super yeah, and, lucky, isn't it, to have yeah, that relationship? Yeah, it's lucky, and also kind of, it's made me turn down gigs over the years because I'm like, I I don't want to, you know, like for me it was like I clearly I like that relationship with an artist, and you know, in terms of being a session player, it's like I don't I can't really do a different type of session in like oh I'm not interested in it because mm. I, that was such a, a specific experience and I got on and everybody was like uh, very nice on the road like you know it's like a family so um for me that's always been important and every every thing I get involved with I try to make sure that there is that vibe behind it otherwise you know I it kills it kills the job for me so yeah yeah I remember a couple of years ago you saying something to me and I was a bit taken aback at the time I was a bit amazed and it was you were like yeah I, I don't do function gigs anymore and like <laughs> to, to, to most musicians in London at some point have to do functions because they're skin and you know they and there's nothing wrong with doing function gigs I guess it's a massive drag when you're doing them all the time um, and nothing else but you know it's kind of the bread and butter of the music industry yeah and like obviously this podcast is called staying alive and it's just about kind of how people get through and how how have you done it because I was always like that's super cool she's like she's not doing any function gigs anymore but I guess when you're not on tour what do you do to survive yeah that money? So it's like it's weird because like when I it took me a while to decide but then I realized that um for me it was like because the way I am is like when I do a project or do something I I put 100% of myself in you know so yeah. I have to I'm learning this. I didn't, when I probably said that to you at the time, I didn't even realize that that was the <laughs> issue. So the problem is like, if I do function, that becomes like part of a lot of my life because then it's like, you know, every weekend, every blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, okay, cool. So I've got, I've toured for a while. I've got some savings. I have a network. Um, and it's like, so what do I want to do? You know what I mean? It's like, if I keep focusing on the plan B, I'm never going to do plan A, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, so for me, it was like, I just, I was like, I needed to kill that because it was killing, like, I didn't want to play anymore and stuff. So, and I did that. And, you know, is this same thing of like help the universe and the universe will help. And I remember I made the decision and then something came along and it was like this band and I was like, okay, cool then I started doing this band full time that you might know, like a uh, Christian plays in it, Electric Pyramid now, you know, so yeah, that yeah. came along. Um, I started sessioning for this choir, which is like still doing covers, but it was a completely different thing. You know, I put together, um, then a get Cape where Cape fly call me and he was starting to in his new album. So I started doing that. And then, you know, and then sometimes like, I remember there was one summer where I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do now? And every time I'm always like, okay, if nothing comes in, um, I can sort of survive. Like, and you know, like I always keep my, I always try to cover my costs with stuff. Like I have a studio and I like rent it out. So that pays for itself. Like, I mean, just make sure that my cost is like covered. And then, um, and then I, you know, I got a call and it was like, Oh, do you want to do this theater stuff? And I never done to theater. So I did theater and then, you, you know, like you do theater and it's like, that's a lot of money, you know, all of a sudden so that you can roll on that and then something comes out. So is it, I guess there's less security in it and it was a different decision. And then, you know, I started doing Girls Rock London, which at the beginning was, which is for the listeners is a charity I founded. And, uh, and at the beginning, it wasn't making any money. But then, you know, we every year we would make we would like for the organizers, we have like we get paid a little bit. So, you know, there was like a, lo a lot of like different things that eventually were feeding into what I was doing. And then, you know, Kate would go out and do a tour or we would do that. So there was always like something, you know. Yeah, I guess that's you're in a really lovely position, I suppose, with that in the, in the 
you know, you can say yes to things that you really want to do most of the time. But obviously, you know, it, it's because you're great and people want to work with you. And, you know, you, you, <coughs> these projects come in, I suppose. But yeah. I guess I guess what, what advice would you give somebody who's just starting out and, and wants to do what you do? I think there is, like, for me, it's like, it's putting put in rules in place like and, I, and this is like that was for me the rule of functions is like I don't want to do functions so whatever I do has like I'm not going to do that so I need to find another way to survive you know yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and so for me it's just like it's having a plan B is good but actually don't have a plan B is plan B sometimes is better because it means that you're going to put everything you can in plan A. Right, right. Um, uh, and I think that's like probably the, the advice I w I'd give to anybody starting now, which is like, yes, like, you know, build whatever you got to do to make sure that you survive, do it, but don't fool yourself. Whenever you, whenever, like I never trust in my life whenever there's something that's like oh but i need to do this because otherwise that's when i know that it's like okay then i'm gonna prove that this is wrong so that i go against it you know that's yeah, just like how i think the, the that happened for me and you know i remember there was um this girl when i decided the function thing i remember that i i was you know i had to find some depths from for some gigs that i had already booked and i didn't want to do and i remember messaging this girl um that i met at school and i was like oh i've got this function gig like well paid and stuff and she was like oh thank you so much but you know like i i just i don't do function i was like oh that's interesting so i was like you know and i've seen that it's just like a different I guess it's a different mentality. And, and again, it's like, you just have to make that decision with everything because you don't do that. Then you might do theater, but do you want to do theater? Like you don't do that. You might do session. Like, do you want to mm. do session? You do that. You might do songwriting. It's like, do you want to do songwriting? Like, what do you want to do? I guess is the question for me, like ultimately, you know? Yeah, definitely. It's ex I guess it's the same for me these days. I'm a bit luckier these days that I can pick and choose a bit more. And, and, uh, but I remember like people asking me to do like, you know, like a Bon Jovi tribute or like a Guns N' Roses tribute. And it's uh, like people always see me with the way I look at my hair and my voice and they, they assume that's what I'm into, you know? And yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I, I'm like, I couldn't go out there and just be like, welcome to the jungle every night. It's just not me, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not my vibe. I guess it's about, you know, wh whether you're doing covers or or you you know like theater or whatever you say it's about being true to yourself isn't it and you know keeping your integrity and yeah. just being I guess with you you're just sort of unashamedly yourself aren't you and yeah, I try I try yeah <laughs> <laughs> and can we just go back and talk a bit about Girls Rock London because yeah sure you're, you're being very modest it's like it's pretty amazing what you've done really uh so we founded this uh charity it was five years ago now um and it's called girls rock london um and basically what we do is like we run uh, workshops uh intense intense music <laughs> workshop for uh women girls non-binary trans uh folks and stuff so um the whole point behind it being like the idea is to make music more accessible uh to these groups because there is a gap in the industry but also there is also like something that's beyond that which is like a lot of uh like you know women are not allowed to play instruments you know when they grow or they think they can't do it you know there's a huge study in like lack of self-confidence and perform in performance and stuff so i guess what we do is like we do this uh camps um and at the end uh people play instruments you know and it's very diy like the whole ethos is is very punk diy so it's just like just go out and do it like the point is it's better to just try it than not try it because at least if you try it, you know whether you like it or not and then you can become good at it but if you don't try then you'll never know you know because you're scared so to give you an example of um a camp like an adult camp would happen on a, a bank holiday. So there's 25 people that come in 
on a Friday night. Most of them have never played instrumental prayer, barely. They choose an instrument and we put them in bands in two days. They learn the basic of the instrument. They write a song and then on Monday they perform a song in front of an audience wow. like of 200 people. And of course, like sometimes the songs are great. Sometimes the songs are a train wreck. Sometimes it's yeah. like, it's, but it's amazing because it just, I learned so much by facilitating this stuff and putting it together because it made me realize of like, oh, I don't need to like waste two weeks on a song. Like, you know what I mean? I could write 20 songs in two weeks and then out of those 20 songs, there is one song that might be good. You know, it's like, it's like a different like uh, way of looking at quantity and stuff. And of course there's like, um, I don't know, there's been like great stories coming out. Like it's been going on for five years we've been funded by um arts council like national lottery and uh, you know there's like and now the community has grown to like 80 volunteers and you know it's it's amazing and i'm really proud of it um and you know there's we've had this one example was that uh this uh this camper came to camp and she was from uh, germany and she said uh she never she always played the guitar but she never had the courage to do it and she finished camp she went back to germany quit her job and then came to london to study music right <laughs> and now she Amazing. just like you know finished music school and trying to do music you know so i guess is is a uh, is giving people an opportunity to do it and of course there's a lot of work into you know working with minorities and trying to like um yeah, work on that, you know, like, and the queer community and all of that. So um, it's, I mean, I, I feel like I've, you know, in a, in ratio to how I dress, it's like my, like, I started guys work London dressing way more in black. And now I'm just like, <laughs> as you described, so that's definitely helped that I think in terms of like, you know, it's a, it's been fun to put together. Yeah, well, it's it's super inspiring and it's amazing. Yeah. And I think I think I might have donated a bass guitar to Girls Rock London because I still haven't had that back. <laughs> Do you remember? Have you? No. <laughs> There's oh, a mate, little. Is that the squire? The little squire bass. It's a, it's in our studio, oh, man. Yeah, it's okay. I, I you was need kidding. To let... I was totally kidding. I was totally kidding. I've yeah. got super space here anyway, but. <laughs> mate. I, no, but literally, it's in our like you haven't donated it to me and Marco, so you can take that anytime you want. <laughs> no, on, honestly, mate, it's totally inspiring, and and I just want to talk more broadly about like you know women in music in general. Obviously, you know, I think I think things are better than they probably were once, but you know, I think there's still this kind of stigma around women in music in that if somebody if somebody's playing with I don't know Jeff Beck or Prince or somebody. It's like they got they got that gig because she's a girl, rather than yeah. the fact that they're just a fucking brilliant musician like you and Carmen and Aisha and all these amazing musicians that there are around. So how how do you think is the best way to kind of tackle that moving forward? And yeah, I think I mean I think yeah, there's so much to do still. Like there is especially in terms of like musician and like there's you know is a thing that has to happen from the top and from the bottom so like like for instance girls work london is something that starts from the bottom so we work with the public and and just like you can do this and then the top is like companies and artists have to take responsibility on uh you know festivals have more like female in their lineup and like you know more diversity you know and and same for artists like i think I think that it's it's not maybe talked about that much is about the shift of power and it's like and that's where the hard part comes which is like creating it's it's again about creating space like if nobody leaves the, their space there will never be space for people to take up that space and uh, the problem is that when I find that when somebody's like oh but they just do that because they're girls is it's jealousy right it's mm -hmm. like you'd want to do that and and maybe yeah that's helped us that's helped us in a way to get there but it's one opportunity out of like a billion opportunities that are out there for other people you know what I mean so um, I think and also like as as we 
our professional and we do what we do and I think there is like a, a, a huge importance in mentoring and making sure and giving opportunities um so you know like I think if you are an artist and you're looking for somebody to work with then it's going to be harder to find female players or queer players or like you know uh, whatever and so so then but you got to go out there and just look for them you know because if you just stop and and look for the easy answer which is like oh my mate plays the guitar so I'm gonna get him then Mm -hmm. you know that's not going to help anybody like that's not going to help the cause. So I think, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a conscious, um, taking of responsibility of like, okay, I believe in this cause. So everything I do has to reflect that, you know, and you know, I've, I've heard this, I've had friends, artists that, uh, you know, they've, they've let go of their old band because they wanted to have a diverse band and stuff. And, and you talk to some, some of the old musicians and they're like, Oh yeah, but it's just because they want it like an old girl band. It's like, yes and no, man. Like, yeah, but it makes sense because this artist stands for this. So it doesn't make sense that she plays with you because you don't have the same vision that this artist has, you know? So I guess, I guess that that's what I mean is like it's hard as well because of course as I said it's like it it requires a lot of effort all the time to do that you know yeah I guess it comes back to integrity again because if if I if I start a solo career and I go I want all girls in my band just because I I wanna because I'm doing it my, for selfish reasons that I want to make a statement and I'm using it for my own benefit then then it's not a positive thing. But if I'm doing it for the right reasons, like you're saying about that, that I truly feel that, I, you know, that I want to be diverse and, and uh, you want to create, create space for people in the industry, like you're saying, then yeah. you're doing it for the right reasons, aren't you? I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the thing is like, if you, if you're like, Oh, I'm just going to put an all girl band. Cause that's going to give me some press. It's like, yeah, hey, yeah. I mean, we're in tw- 2020 that doesn't work anymore, but also like, <laughs> like uh but also yeah it's not the right reason but if you're like i'm gonna give this people opportunity i think that's that's exactly what it is you know and it's you know there's a lot of talk of like the problem it is as well for instance in in companies and stuff that is like leadership leadership like a lot of these companies were created by you know men and stuff so it means that there's not a lot of leadership in for women so you know it's about like encouraging your mates to start something you know so the more everybody starts something then it means that their integrity and their beliefs will reflect on what they start you know so that's what I mean is like it's a delicate thing that has to start from everywhere you know yeah like an analogy that leaves humans uh, out of it you know so it doesn't get like oh I hate man or whatever it's like it's with food you know like it's it's like it's like eating veggie or eating healthier deciding I'm not going to buy food from here. I'm not going to do that. You know, it's like, it's like you have to like shift your brain and then make the effort. And then you're like, okay, cool. That makes sense. Like I'm not going to eat like meat or I'm not going to eat from McDonald's ever again, you know, like, and that's the only way that that's going to change, you know? It's like, it's like you said earlier about having, having these rules and having these absolutes in your life obviously I'm veggie and for me like I always say it's like you know when you teach children that something's hot you just that's the way my brain is shifted towards meat now I mean I, I still eat fish and stuff so I'm a sort of a terrible vegetarian really but but I kind of you know I've just kind of retrained my brain that that's that's good yeah. and that's bad and this is what I like to eat and this is what not and that's yeah. my choice and um yeah if you have those rules and those absolutes then that's how you live your life and if, if everyone shifted to that way of thinking then I guess well, especially when it comes to food I think people would be healthier anyway yeah um, I think I think the point like and this is a very important thing I think which is you know where when there's like a struggle like that is always like it's hard as well like you know for instance you're a man so it's like, like how do I help this so there's the whole talk about allies you know and that's mm-hmm. the that's the thing like we need people like you that are just like cool like look at my mates they're all like sick players like you know what I mean I was like I'm gonna create the space and give 
like voice to my mates, you know, and taking on that struggle. Like, I think that's, that's where a lot of people are just like, Oh, it's not my problem. So I, I'm, it's, they're either against it or they don't know how to do it. So they, they just ignore it, you know, whereas it's just like, no, just take it on or just be like, okay, cool. I'm going to try and do something about it. You know, like, you don't have to like all of a sudden just play with like girls, but just like, you know, just, <laughs> like, like <laughs> yeah you're gonna next time you see me romances is just gonna be me and four girls <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> linda told me to <laughs> can, Sorry, can, we, guys. <laughs> can we go back to i want to go back to talking about you now and about your your playing specifically so firstly as a guitarist how would you describe yourself and like who are your influences and stuff um I think I grew up uh, I grew up on the Jimmies. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Good old doses of Jimmies. So um Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, like Eric Clapton, um and all of that. So I would say like David Gilmer, like when I used to like when I was like early twenties, I used to say like yeah, I want my right hand to be like Stevie Ray Morgan and my left hand to be like David Gilmer. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's kind of like where I first saw it. But then definitely now I'm more, I left the technicalities all of, and all of that behind. I don't know. I just like really like to experiment with the guitar. Like I think I got to a, a level of pr- proficiency where I can just get creative. Yeah, um, sure. And I also realized that I just don't have the patience to be so good you know what I mean I just I just like I I can't I don't have the patience to learn the solos to be like you know I'm a dirty guitarist I think that's like you know yeah well it's definitely it's you definitely have your own sound and it's you know it's just brilliant I, oh, thanks. I love it I love playing with you and um I wanted to ask about your gear as well for any gearheads. Like you've got this iconic looking like red and black telly that is just yes. amazing. Is that is that your main guitar that you play all the time? Yeah, so that's been um yeah, that's been my main guitar for seven years. It's actually like I found a picture the other day and I got it on the third of April two thousand thirteen. Like I found the picture of the day I bought the guitar uh, and I just found it in Denmark Street and it's a telly with a P90s um, and it's a reissue of the 1972 vintage version of it, basically. And I think basically I was so lucky because Fender stopped doing them and I must have caught one of the last ones of those. I've never um, seen one that looks the same, actually. Yeah, I've only seen another person with it and it all and they have it all black which is mm. they look sick um and i love that guitar like i've always before that i was a strat girl actually i used mm. to play and then and now like when i play the strat i was like this is so weird man because <laughs> like, yeah. got like missing like half of the weight of it yeah um yeah. so i yeah that's i would say that's my main guitar i've I've got this, uh, well, I, I'm, it's on video, but I've got this, like, 12-string Dan Electro that I'm riding a lot with now. Amazing. Uh, electric. Um, and then I've got this new band, so I'm using that telly that you were talking about, but I bought a Submarine pickup. Cool. Uh, which is basically a pickup that you can attach to the guitar, and uh, and it only picks up, picks up two strings so basically it, it has a different output and it picks up the e and the a string so in this band i we don't have a basis so the output of those two things go to a bass amp and a sub pedal and it sounds fucking huge it's like boom. so cool so you're yeah. playing so you're essentially you're playing guitar and bass at the same time yeah so i got rid of <laughs> i got rid of the problem and the basis right? <laughs> that's super cool and and uh, I just want to talk about very quickly Sam as well. So you're playing with Get Kate, Where Kate Fly. Yeah. How long have you been playing with him and, and how did how did that come about as well? So I've been playing uh, with Sam for two years now. Uh, I think two years. Yeah, two years and something. And um, well, I've known Sam for, again, I think seven or eight years because he, he's really good mate with Kate. And Jay, my housemate, used to play for Kate Um he was the first guy to ever play with Kate, actually. And um, and him and Sam had a studio together. So uh, we played this, like, little enemy awards show at the um, Seabright R 
years ago. Yeah. And as Sam was recording this album, and then I remember Jay introduced me to Sam, and it was like, oh, we're recording an album, dude. Do you want to do a solo? And then we just they had the studio in Oxford Square, and like we went there, stayed up all night, and like did this crazy solo. <laughs> and then Amazing. and then the morning after we got up and listened to the solo, I was like, oh my god, we definitely went too far. <laughs> <laughs> so we recorded it but anyway from then i've always been super good friend with sam and he he's like you know he quit get cape like he started different projects and then when he reloaded get cape where cape fly he 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 decided that he finally wanted a you know a, a guitarist i guess like a doodling guitarist noodling a guitarist so he called me up and was like i think you're you know you're you're not jazz and you're punk enough so do it <laughs> <laughs> it's it's super cool when when like your buddies end up at like the same festivals and stuff i remember when you guys were playing at isle of white festival and we were oh, playing there the so same day fun. yes and we got to see you guys and you guys came to see us it was like it's always just amazing isn't it when you see your mates because you always feel like I, I always do it. Anyway. I always feel like I'm going to get found out and they're going to kick me out. Like I'm not supposed to be there. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> like, what, what am I doing at this festival? You know, and then, then uh, like, that's my mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. That was such a good festival. I got a free guitar as well. Oh, you <laughs> did made... get a free guitar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Yeah. And it's super fun. Like, I mean, the thing with Sam is like, we've been touring the last two years with like a seven piece band and, some of them are my friends from uni and some of them are my friends from London. So it's like, it's literally like going on a school trip every time we go. Yeah. On school. It's like, <laughs> it's so stupid, you know, <laughs> like, like, but fun. That's what it should be like. Right? Yeah. It's just so 100%. Fun. Yeah. And, and how about your own stuff? Obviously uh, over the years, you've had a few different projects and so what yeah, are you doing so at the moment? I'm, I'm working on, I've got this new band, it's called Self, and we're developing the whole concept now. And it's basically like cyberpunk with the duo. So the the music the music side of it is like um, guitar and drums. And with that setup, I told you, and we sound pretty heavy. So it's kind of like drums. Um, it's this uh, girl called Mariel. She's from Argentina. Uh, she lives in London. Um and um so and she's very loud she's like proper uh, good rock drummer and um yeah so and so it's kind of like quite proggy as well it's a bit of metal like vibe in it because it's like quite heavy but then the singer is like this incredible kate bush Haley williams melodies on top of it so it's like a very interesting project and the singer is a writer actually so it's written this all like multiverse planet concept behind the band so uh, i'm very excited uh by it and uh so we're developing now we're releasing i think in a few months awesome i can't wait uh, to come see it i we, we were saying weren't we before i can't remember whether we were rec rec recording or not because it's an hour ago now but just like when we get to go to the first gig after this lockdown we're just gonna cry i know yes <laughs> just gonna can't be wait awesome. to hug all my friends yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i know I cry every time I walk out now. It's like queuing up a waitress, like uh, almost. <laughs> it's oh, like, just anxiety, isn't it? Just yeah. like back off, motherfuckers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, a, a cool. So, is there anything else coming up that you can tell us about? Like, what's coming up next? Or? No, I mean, I'm I'm writing. Also, my quarantine side project is become out of like, random. Somebody asked me to do a streaming gig, so I've started writing uh, songs where I'm where I'm producing them and playing guitar in it, uh, about Street Fighter, the the game. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> so so I don't know, I think I'm gonna do an album and then we can when we when we do the launch we'll do a Street Fighter tournament. That's so so cool. What was your favorite <laughs> have you ever played Street Fighter? I have years ago. I can't remember any of the characters' names right. though. Sweet. Well, we, you know, do your search. Be prepared, mate. Cause, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm so up for that. That sounds amazing. Jess, Jess who's uh, Ashby's girlfriend, was an amazing makeup artist. Like, I, I told her the other day, and she just, like, started sending me all this, like, body paint of, like, three Yeah, characters. of course. <laughs> yeah, get Jess involved. It's going to look amazing. Yeah. One night, one night. All right, well... 
before you go, I'm going to ask you to do this one section that I've been doing with all of my guests so far. Yeah. And it's it's called One Night Only. And basically, I, I, I imagine I know which option you're going to pick, but I ask everyone to pick either a super group, so a band that you could be with for one night only and who would be yeah. in that band, or a five-a-side football team and you could pick anyone. To or play. a what? A I five-a-side s- football team. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to do the band. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> so who would be in your super group? So obviously you're on guitar. I'm on guitar. Uh, then I have... Um, Am I on guitar? Yeah, I'll be on guitar. Fuck it. And then, uh, <laughs> I guess you could have more than one guitar, more yeah. than one guitar if you wanted. I think I would have uh, Corny Barnett on the other guitar. Very cool. uh, then I'd have um, Sheila E on drums. Nice. And the, this is going to be, this sound is so weird already. <laughs> uh, probably, and then I have Billy Corgan on bass. Yes. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe I'll just have like Messi trying to sing as well little Messi <laughs> so, yeah yeah amazing you know, just like throw a little bit of football maybe he's a good singer who knows yeah who knows <laughs> he might be yeah. yeah thank you so much for for uh, coming on and doing this it's so I inspiring to talk to you to and you. I miss you man it's, I can't wait to see you I can't <laughs> wait it's gonna be so much fun yeah All right, peace. Peace. Ah. Ciao. (laughs) So there we have it. Thanks so much to Linda for coming on the pod and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Linda by visiting Boom Vision on Instagram and make sure you go follow Girls Rock London. My guest next week on the pod is legendary songwriter and Haircut 100 frontman Nick Hayward. So make sure you tune in for that one. And you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash stayinalivepod. And you can go one step further and head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. This was a Jesse Smith production. Music by Neil X, Mark Garfield, and me. If you or your business is interested in sponsoring the show, or you'd just like to say hi, you can get in touch by emailing stayinalivepod at gmail.com. So until next week, be nice, try to stay alive, and I'll see you soon.